How do you like the conference so far? Yay! Good, thank you. Thank you. And the food? Yay! <laughs> that wasn't as quick response as I was hoping for, but... <laughs> And the, and the beer was good as well, yeah. <laughs> so for upcoming conferences, we need to have the beer, the food, and no sessions. No, just kidding. Uh, have you been up looking into this turning torso yet? Anyone seen it? No, you, you can't, I don't think you can go up. I don't know about that one. But you can be just beneath it, looking up at it. It's not too far, actually. It's, it's but a... 10, 15 minutes walk from here? Very, <laughs> sorry? 22. Okay, 22, good, yes. Someone from here actually could talk. Uh, yeah, I assume people are kind of running out from the different rooms here trying to catch a... But it's, it's, it's one o'clock, so um, we are on a time schedule, so we've got to get started. Thank you very much for being here today. And then today we're going to talk about how to get the best out of your existing solution, because all of us already have a solution that we have, don't we? And for those who don't know me, uh, we asked everyone to present themselves a little bit. Uh, I'm Johan Hedman, I'm working for Square Moon, and uh, I know uh, one of those guys that like to be out there doing adventure on different places. Uh, besides that, I also like to talk and, and eat good food, so the Italian guys and I had a really nice conversation the other day here. Uh, no, I, went, I know, uh, I know need, where I need to go next time I visited Italy. Um, I have a few certifications, and uh, I like to go around and spreading the word about the FileMaker platform. So I, I've been attending a few conferences and speaking at those. But today we're going to talk about things that we already have, and things that we can make better out of what we already have. And I think that is important because through this conference, we learned a lot of new things that we can adapt to existing things. But we already have something that we're stuck with. And some of the things we've done in the past is not maybe the most proud things that we've done. But we're stuck with them because we have done them. They're a part of our solution. And the ultimate goal, wouldn't that be that we have a happy user? No matter if it's ourselves using that solution or if we have users trying to do run our solution. So in the long run, we can have a happy user. That would be the best optimal goal. So the agenda today is to try to get you to understand that you need to set up some kind of a standard. And then I'll walk you through some things on how we can develop on steroids legally. Um, and then I kind of tweak in a little thing on how we can optimize our programming to make it faster depending on the things we have right now. And I'm not going to go through Clary Studio. We are going to stick with what we have in Draco. And then I think it's very important that we understand that we actually need to analyze our solutions. We need to understand what's sitting there right now to get it better for the future. So let's get started with the first one. So we need to set up some kind of a standard. And we already probably have been working with something that we thought was a standard. And then throughout the years, we involved that one being something else. We adapted what things are doing for other companies. We're setting up standards where someone else had, because we thought that was a good way of doing things. So you might even have multiple standards in your own solution. And that's never a really good thing. If you're working on your own, you might be able to control everything by yourself. If you're an in-house, you might have one solution. If you're working for multiple projects, it would be good if you all worked and did the same thing. So setting up a standard is, for me, using the same kind of a language throughout the entire solution, and a language that everyone can understand. So uh, a language could be multiple things. One of the things is you need to write the names of your fields, your tables, your layouts, so that every single one in your team would understand what you're writing for. And I'm not saying any of these two are the best or the worst. I'm just saying you should stick to a standard that is good for you and for your team. And what's also very good is that uh, some of these ones aren't really good for web purposes. So try to stick to something that eventually you might need for the web. So if they're web friendly, you could use them straight off once you start setting up an API or something else that be useful for your client. 
And then we have this all kind of different naming conventions and uh, find something called kebab. That's food for me, but yeah, there is a case for that one. <laughs> but there are all different kinds here. And, and the one that I really like and I find easy to read is the one called Pascal case. So it starts with an uppercase. And then if you need another word, it will continue to have another uppercase. For me, that is easy, and for my, my eye, that's easy to, uh, to read. And also, that's good, something that works good on the web. Next thing is that we need to document our things. And every single script that I write has this start. So it starts off with the purpose of what this script is for. And then I want to know if it has any parameters. There, if there's just one, if there's none, I need to know that. I need to know what the purpose is. I know what kind of data that comes into that script. Then I want to know where is it called from, because that's also really good to know. Is it called from an API? Then you need to know. You need to be aware of that one. Or is it just from a button? It should be named button. Then it would be to know that it's Philip who actually wrote this script from start, or if it's Christine or anyone else, because that person probably had a thought of why they did this. And then if you also add when it was created and the history of it. So here you write out the big changes of the script, why it was changed and for what purpose. And then if you need any further notes, you add those. Then in my scripts, I like the spaces, because for my eyes it becomes easier to read. And in this case, in this script, I had two parameters. And then I always show the case of what parameters will look like, because then I can easily take that example, put that into a button, and try to see if it's actually working. So then you have a working example of the parameters I'm asking for, which is two different UUIDs, one for the order and one for the person. And this could have been in JSON. It could be in all different kind of formats. Just in this purpose, we use a pipe to separate the different parameters. There are different kinds of documentation you can do. So within a script, you can write your documentation. And already here, you need to write down why you're doing things. Because if someone else comes into your script later on, they need to understand the purpose of why you're doing that. If it's good documented, it will make self-explained, and you don't need to think about it. And then we also have this way of writing calculations in our custom functions, in our fields, where you can use slash slash and the comment, or you can do the other ones where you do slash star, and then you write a comment, and then you have to finish with a star and slash. So once you start using this one, even a really hard while function or a let function will actually have a purpose, so everyone will understand it. So every single one in this room are some kind of a problem solvers. No matter what you do at your business, we all solve problems for our customers. So uh, for Robert, it's about solving the problems that we have. But we are solving problems for our customers right there on the field. And to do that, we need to understand what the problem actually are. And we are probably the best to understand our customers, sometimes even better than they know. But to do that, we are trying to set up workshops with the client, not getting the CFO, not getting the CEO, by getting a super user. You need to find that user who actually are working on that department or doing that purpose, so that you can get the right kind of details of what you're actually going to build. And then, once you've done that, you need to divide that job into different chokes or modules that you will build for the client. And you need to put that in, in writing. So it needs to be somewhere that you actually can connect and, and specify that. So what we do is that we use a project leading system where we say, so within this scope, this module, this version, this is going to be what it's in it. And then we write down each of those specifications it's going to be in. So once the time for the release, they already know what's going to be released. And also for us going back later on, these are the things that we had for the different versions that we released for the customer. And then as the, a developer, we are the worst ever tester on our own things. We should never test our own things because we build things out of our minds. So we already had a purpose of how we think the function should work. You need someone else to do the testing. Not everyone have a group that is doing that, but you need to go to somewhere else to do the testing, and preferably before you go and give it to your customer. Mm -hmm. So 
this is a Swedish shrine uh, saying you should stick on the road, but I think that's also sticking to our purpose. I think you need to stick to the modules and the version that you should and never let anyone else try to control that. That's always going to cause you problems because if once you start hacking a little bit in, on, on the parts of the module, they're going to ask for more because they know usually that in FileMaker we can do things within an hour or two or three, so you can just squeeze it in, it's easy for you. <laughs> so to avoid that, stick on the road, finish the module, you can have another release, release later on. So uh, we use uh, a tool to keep track of everything. In our case, we use Favro. There are other ones like Asana and other things. But we are using every single one of us at the Square Moon, we're using Favro to keep track of things. Uh, and it's really good because it also gives us a chance to see how much of a job we actually have and where it's spread out because we can see who's be, going to be the person or the person taking care of each part of that release. And then, thanks you to Robert and other people over at Declarus, we have a tool called DMT, the Data Migration Tool. And I can't really work without that tool, because when we do versioning, having that tool, that's the only thing that's going to be uh, working. You remember when we had to export data and import data, setting the serial number and all those tricks? I mean, this tool, it's a lifesaver and a time saver. So, the DMT, if you're using Otto or if you're directly using that one, it's superb. And one thing that I actually learned just this upcoming week when I had a big release was that running it on a Windows machine compared to a Mac, it's like one tenth of the time. So if you want to do the, run the DMT, you should put it into your Mac and run it there rather than running it directly on the server because it's super fast on a Mac. So. I'm not going to give you any steroids here. I'm just going to give you a few tools of what you can do to make Draco behave a little better. So like John said here on his session just before we had lunch, you need to start the planning before you get to work. So you need to actually show the client what you're going to do. So spot the logical modules that you think will be working for the client. Do mockups. Present those mockups to the client so you're on the same page. The clients need to know what you're going to build and approve to that one before you get started, because usually what we do in FileMaker, we just get started. It's so easy to get started because we know what we are supposed to do, but you need your client to be on the same page as you are. And most probably you have done and solved this problem before for another client. So make files for different purposes. Create custom functions that you can reuse. Have layouts like Jan showed where you have the different design parts that you need for a layout. So when it's time to do your development, I always, and I mean always, I use the separation model. Who are not familiar with the separation model? Everyone. Okay, cool. Thank you. So that means that we have one data file or several data files. We have one UI file or several UI files if needed. And then they have them for different purposes. So, for example, in this case, uh, we have one UI file that we use for FileMaker Pro. And then we're most probably going to have another one for FileMaker Go because they only need to see a little bit of the data set uh, that's that they're going to use once they're out on the field, not the entire database. So they don't need to have that whole relationship graph and all those functions that we built for FileMaker Pro. So it's so much easier for you to create a smaller FileMaker Go solution it's just going to be available on their apps. So I, what I try to do when I have a, a, a bit larger solution is I try to separate things into different files. And I try to have one UI file, unless it's going to be FileMaker Go, but sticking just to FileMaker Pro then, or Claris Pro. Then I'll have one or many data files, and I'll show you the reason for that in a minute. Then I have one file to keep the logic, meaning like system data, settings, uh, that kind of things that's going to be unique for this solution. Uh, and then we have one file for all the external files. And I'll also tell you why that's important in a bit. And then we have one separate file for WebDirect, because in WebDirect you want to have as few things connected to that file as possible to make it run fast. You don't want a whole bunch of relationship graphs with toes going all over, because that's going to make the file slow. And then we have a separate file for external communication. 
if, for example, you have customer or need to reach your data, you're going to set up a, a, a unique file to set up for the API calls you're going to have, or PHP, or whatever things you want to have that. Same thing there. You want that file to be as little as possible, and then it will become much faster for you. So if we take one of my bigger clients, you can see there are a whole bunch of files here called data. Data, data one, data communication, data contact, and so on. And the reason for me doing this is that I've learned that eventually, and not in a good way, FileMaker sometimes quits. And when that happened, if your files weren't closed in a good manner, your files might get corrupted. And a file that is over 5 gig sometimes takes you up to a day to verify that it's correct. You can have a client waiting for a day to see if that data is going to be up and running again. You might have a backup, so you lose two or three hours. But if you have a file that's no more than 5 gig, then that thing when it's verifying your file, it's so much faster. It's like after 5 gig, then the data is so big that it's just taking so much, much, much longer. So my theme is that whenever a file is getting closer to five, then I'm dividing it up to two. And I'm doing that with a tool called Base Elements, where it will tell me exactly where each point of that file for those tables that I'm moving is going to be uh, located, so I can easily move those into the new file. So say, for example, I want to duplicate this data file. I do a copy of that one. And then I, I start looking into what tables I want to have in the second one. And then, once that is done, I do a DDR, and I'll show you how that works. And then I can see where each of those two files is going to be uh, representative on the other parts. So then I can just start picking those tables from the right file, and those will be then represented with the files you have. And then running the DMT later on will just move the data into the correct new file. So that is the reason why I have many things. And going down to the doc file, the, the file where we keep all the external files, is that I want to have a unique table for every single occurrence of the table that I need to store external databases. So there will be one for my orders that I print for PDFs. There will be another one for my invoices and such. And I want them to be stored in a calculated folder all of those calculations will be in a unique table. And then that file is always going to be super small because it's just holding the reference to where it's stored and the ID, and then the external file is actually located somewhere else in externally. OK, I like the three R's to reduce, reuse, and recycle. So. We have done a lot of things throughout the years with FileMaker, and some of those are really good. So you should reuse the code you already done. So try to get a template of the file that you've done so that you can reuse it. Create an API of functions that you can reuse so that someone else also can use it. That's really good to have other people not having to invent the same thing you already done. So for custom functions, themes, like John told us just before, or integrations you've done before, try to make those into one little test file that you can reuse the functionality for. OK, optimizing programming. Now we're getting into some details here. So we all have our layouts. Some have more, some have less. Some have hundreds. Some might even have thousands. Those layouts have things on that are affecting how your solution is going to work. So, so, for example, you might want to create a dashboard with data coming from different places. Then you create data that's just going to be visible for that graph, for those KPIs. And, and what's going to happen is that you don't relate to FileMaker data that sits one or two or three tables away, because that's not going to work. Drake is not really built for that purpose. It's built for other purposes. So if you want to have a dashboard filled with data, you produce kind of nightly or you produce new data to every two hours, but a, a scheduled script that produces data for you so that you can show this user the upcoming data in a really fast way. Understanding how FileMaker layouts work is also a really, really good way. So the themes that we have in FileMaker 
are spread up in, we can say, three different parts. This is a very old slide I got from um, a DevCon, probably eight years ago when WebDirect was uh, invented. And in every single file, you have that default theme. The default theme is going to follow you along to once you start creating your layouts. That theme holds a whole bunch of things that you've got to have for granted. You assign themes, uh, um, saved into that layout. Then you start doing your custom things on that layout. You see how we are adding up layers here. Then you might store things on that layout. That are, you do changes on that layout that aren't stored within that theme. That's the fourth layer. You might even do some local formatting, aligning a field to the right. So you see that red arrow on the line, right side where you have your styles. And then furthermore, you might add some conditional formatting to your layout. That adds up being six different layers that every layout needs to load. In Firefox, you have a viewer calling 3D viewer. And if you look to a normal web page, it's probably going to look something like this, that you have four or five different layers. If we use that same thing on WebDirect, we will actually see how many layers the FileMaker engine actually have to produce to show you FileMaker WebDirect. So everything up to this red one here, the top red one, is how many layers of FileMaker code and needs to be pushed for showing the records that we have on the layouts. From there, you will start seeing things happening. So up to here are the number of records needing to show one record. From there, we have the local formatted things. We have the conditional formatting, meaning on every record that I show in my list, they will have to load local things. And local things are adding up. So the more local things you have on layouts, the slower your layout's going to become, especially when you are on WebDirect. So we have one really big thief here, and that's uh, an old thing we, we kind of brought along when we did our <laughs> conversion from older version of FileMaker, and that's the classic thing. We all have been there, we all tried to convert things from there, but what I urge you to do is not actually trying to convert a classic theme layout into something else. Much rather you create a new layout and you pick a theme that you created from start, where it's just holding those different parts of the style that you need. And also, WebDirect don't fully support the classic mode. So there are some parts that's not going to appear or work as well either. So if you can, it would be good to stay out of classic uh, theme the, as much as possible. So John talked a little bit about um, uh, the different styles you have and how they build up and things like that, and that there are ways to can I spin off and do changes to the CSS by a tool that you can find in the community. But you kind of need to understand how this works, actually. And that is that every object are signed up being an object within that CSS. And if you do an update of that file, or if FileMaker decides that Enlighten now going to have this color or this form, it's going to affect that theme that you kind of played with a little in the background. So even though that the things you're releasing right now might look good, in the long run, you wouldn't know what's going to happen when FileMaker do changes to Enlighted or whatever it might be. But you also need to understand what changes that you do to the JSON or uh, the CSS that's going to make it much faster. So on the left side here, you're seeing a classic theme CSS. This is going to run for a very, very long time because every single object have their own uh, CSS. Whereas on the right side, I added the uh, same layout, and I started to produce my own theme. The CSS is loading so much faster, and therefore your page will load faster. So in recent uh, release, 19.1, I think we got the Apex Blue. And if you compare Apex Blue to any one we've been given before, it, it holds like almost a half of the amount of things that you get from start. So it's a good way to start with Apex Blue because that will save you tons of CFS you need to start off with. But in the long run, you can add up things, but you don't need to delete things that you aren't using. Um, Tony White wrote a really good uh, uh, article that uh, I urge you to read about how you convert your FileMaker classic themes into something else. 
So I urge you to read that one. Uh, and then all things we are producing here, you're going to be able to get uh, uh, the, all the presentations so you can look into this afterwards. We also in FileMaker have something that's been, it's been there for a long time, the format pencil. And that's a tool you shouldn't be using at all. Avoid that for all prices. Because every single time you're using the format pencil in the CSS is adding up one unique CSS for every single time you use it. So even though you did a really, really good job setting up that nice thing with Apex Blue, every time you use the format pencil, it's going to add up a new CSS for that specific object. So if I were working at uh, Claris, I would I'd probably delete that one, but that's not, I'm not working there, so. <laughs> um, so when you're on your layout, you're working with your objects, and you're trying to optimize your solution, one of the parts here is to try to get rid of all of these ones. And like what John said here before is that the default ones are a bit scary because all of your uh, objects, once you start working with it, is going to have that same default one. And if you do any changes, that's going to adapt to all your layouts. So I much rather have you using your own that you set up down here that you use on the layouts, which have a, diff a unique purpose. So it might have a different font, a different size or something, but you name it in a good convention so we will be able to understand why and where it should be used. Uh, so make sure you always save all the changes that you do to your theme so they are a part of it. Um, I know that uh, uh, beeswax are having a really good uh, discount right now, uh, but I'm a, I'm a frequent user of uh, base elements, so I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, what you can do with base elements. So if you're on a DDR using base elements, you probably can do that same thing with from Perception and Spectrum True, but it's just me going to show you what it is like. You see this number down here, 2097. Those are the number of objects that haven't been saved into my file. So those are things that I can improve to make my solution work better. Another thing that I think is also super important for you is that on every single UI file, in some cases even other files, you need to have the two triggers that I've uh, enabled here. The first one in our first open uh, window open, and making sure that your solution is doing what you expect it to do when you're opening up the solution. And the, the second one is the one, once you close the UI file, what you want or what you expect to happen. Probably you want to close all the files that you have referenced, so you don't end up having a server file or a data file being open once the UI file has been closed. So I always use these ones, and then they have different purposes. <laughs> So what it could look like is that I want the user to end up on different layouts depending on from where they are coming, what applications they are using. There could be a whole bunch of different things that you want to do, but make sure you always have a script for on first window open. Then, then we've been having a conversation here about using of uh, script queues and using of uh, perform script on server, and we've seen how fast it is. I mean. Um, Wins here, he presented us on his transaction uh, presentation here that we're going to save tons of time saving the data record and changes using FileMaker Server. And yes, it is a saver, but you need to make sure when you're using it for what purpose. So, uh, uh, John had a really good session of uh, handling things in a script queue. So, if you didn't go to that one, uh, look at the video later on to get a good explanation on how you can handle that one. Well, when you're writing perform script on server, you also need to be aware of there are some script steps that you can't use. So make sure you're setting that one to server in the value list so you know what script set steps you're using. So for example, if you want to do a loop in FileMaker Pro, you most probably have a freeze before you start that loop to make sure it's going to be running fast so the window isn't updated. Whereas that script step is not available for the server, so it's just going to jump over that one. So you don't need that in your code at all. But you, what you do have is that you actually have three engines in FileMaker. And you need to be aware that you have three engines to play with. So you have Pro, which is super fast once you have the data being downloaded to yourself. 
So once you have data stored in your temp files, you download a whole bunch of customers and orders and all of that, that's almost local. So the sorting, the summarize, all of that's going to be quick. But creating records, doing massive changes, imports, other things, super good to be close to the where you actually store your data on the server. So using that being a performative on server. But what we also have, uh, we have a third engine. We have the data API. So you are able to use that engine as well. So you can actually have a queue of things running on different for different purposes to uh, get data load to Pro, to server, and using the data API to trigger script to run for you. So when I create these scripts, when I'm going to run this once, I always create this if statement to make sure that I can always, when I debug, can go into my script and actually debug it. If I'm just having my perform script on server, there's no way for me to actually debug my script. It's just going to run. But, but what I can choose, I can have it to wait for it to be finished or just continue to run. So I always have this if to make sure I have a possibility to go into the script and see what's happening. And, and we saw with Anvin's presentation here that uh, there is a big time saver. So I set up a test scenario uh, where I do a whole bunch of things. So I export 10,000 records in, uh, to, to, from a table. I import them into an Excel, uh, Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I use the replace function. And then uh, I deleted those 10,000 records from another table. And then I created 10,000 records and set a few uh, data. And then I ending up by sorting those records. So if I had that server locally here in Sweden and running directly on FileMaker Pro, that will take me 612 seconds. If I did that same script just using PSOS, that same script took seven seconds. That's 87 times faster. I mean, having your users getting something that's going to run 87 times faster, they're going to be happy. But if you don't, say you're working remotely, so you have a FileMaker Go app, but you don't have, know the, the bandwidth or if you're even going to have bandwidth, then it's even better to do things running on, on different cases. So to kind of test this off, I have a server over in Japan that I can do some testing on from time to time. So from Sweden, I uh, open up this solution. I run that same script on that server in Japan. That took 2,000. Uh, 760 seconds. So it took a, what, quite some while for me to actually wait for that one to finish. Running that same thing on that server from Sweden, triggering it to run, took eight seconds. It's 345 times faster. I mean, sometimes we need to reach data where we aren't on the best location. So you need to find the purpose of when to use the right tools. And in this case, the right tools right now was to run PSOS. Another thing is that you also need to optimize the server and the server installment that you have to actually run faster for you. And Soliant did this really good admin tool, which you can download from this uh, barcode here, where you uh, can use the admin API to set things directly to your server, such as the number of files that you can have open at the same time. And we can have 125, but it's not good to have 125 because each and every one of those files is going to set up a, 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 like a temp file on your server. So it will work faster. So that kind of number should be kind of close to how many files you actually have on your server. And last version, I think 19.2 or something like that, we got a possibility of changing the cache size so we can actually use the cache to run faster or use that better. You can set up how many pro connections you can have on the server. So how many users do you have, actually? How many users will there be at the same time? Don't exceed those being too many. Yes? Do you have a rule of thumb for the cache size being optimized? Um, so we have the right person to, to answer that one. But uh, <laughs> uh, from, from what I have heard, uh, you can increase that with at least five. Yes, but it kind of depends on what kind of processors you have and how much data you're actually writing and, and reading. So it kind of depends on solution as well.
Yes, that, uh, yes. Yeah, I remember reading that one. Uh, and then we have the maximum number of allowed PSOS running at the same time. You're never going to have 500 running at the same time. Then you definitely did something wrong. So that should be the number that you think you're going to be using. Because that's also going to also take up space on your server. You're kind of expecting something to be built out. So if you start optimizing your server to do things right, then it's going to behave much better for you. So download that tool. And then you can set up things much easier on your server. Because in the admin console, you can't do all these things. They aren't available. So please, maybe in the future, we can have those. Yeah. And, and then we have this function that we've been having for years. We got the wow function a while back, really good function. But the let function is really good to kind of calculate things, where we can set our own variables, global, local, and such. But we need to understand what actually happens in file making when we do that. So if we take this example here, we have get the cur uh, current date function. We are getting the due date out of a field. And then based upon those two fields, we are trying to set a text uh, result out of this one, either being expired, time to pay, or plenty of time to pay. <laughs> but if we instead were to use all of these fields and use just the case here, and we had the due date field being get current date, and we had the current or oh, the due date being the actual field, and it was plenty of time to pay. Then every single time here, we had to call FileMaker to get get date, get current date, get due date, get current date, and so. Which means we have to call FileMaker six times to get to the value that we actually have and asked for. So to understand that, you need to uh, write code in a smart manner of how Draco works. And, and one good thing to handle that one is to use uh, a self function, for example, to get data in the way that you want. So in tooltips, then you don't need to call the FileMaker database to actually get the data because it's already right there. Uh, so, for example, if you have um, an email field in your customer table where you have users pasting in things, where they might be red color, font 18, all different kind of formatting, you use the function called text format remove self. And it's already having the value, so it doesn't need to call down to your database to grab that value and then reset it, because it's already there. So here's the time saver just using self. So another thing is also, when you start up your uh, other files, the data file, the server file, the API file, the, the documents file, have this one here, get the application version. And if that one holds the name of server, you know it's a server running, maybe a PSOS or something else. And you don't need to continue run the opening script because it's going to run somewhere else. But don't use the whole script because that will finish everything off. Use the exit script, then we'll just finish this, finish this one off. And second thing here is that when you start up something that you actually want to do, and you're not running on a server, this one here, this one saves you a lot of time. Freeze window. That means you can go to another layout where it actually won't load the data. It will just go there, but in the background. So FileMaker doesn't have to go and catch all that data to be visible for you. Instead, it's just going to that layout, doing whatever you're asking it to do, and then continues. So freeze window is also a time saver where you can save a lot of time for your users. Another thing is that the set variable is excellent. We can do all kind of tricks with that one, but it's not fast when it comes to heavy data. So for example, when you are requesting an API for a JSON data load or something, or you're trying to build up a set of data, that you're going to uh, send off somewhere, or a text, or anything like that you're using. It's much, much better to instead use the function insert calculated result. Whereas in that one, you can, for example, use the list function to set up fields. So say if you had hundreds of records that needed to be created, the list function is just adding up to that same field that I was setting it for, 
the values that I'm adding, and I only want to get unique ones. I don't want any duplicated records. So using this one, I, that's compared to setting up things by adding things up in uh, um, set variable, that saved us like half the time of creating those uh, when we actually tried to uh, test it out to see the difference. So using insert calculated results is also a time saver. And then I like the new feature of unique values because that gives us only the unique values that we want. Another thing is that when we do want to create something, or we want to do some specific that actually doesn't really concern the data that you need or have in that table, we use system layouts. Totally empty layouts in table view. Because in table view, you don't, you don't need to load the CSS for that one. You don't need to load that theme. So that's the first part. Secondly, once you go to that layout and you don't have any fields there, you don't have to actually pull that data in to get any information out of that one. So if you look at here, I have a whole bunch of these system layouts, which I use to create records. I use to, when I import and export, to make sure I'm not catching any information from the database before I start doing something that I want to do. Custom functions are always good, because we can build anything that we want. We can even have them recursive. And once you build them, and you are using them all over your solution, and you do one change, it adapts to everything. And that's the real good trick here. So set up a template file with all the custom functions that you use, or go to Brian Dunning, because most of us have already posted all our best stuff up there, so then you can take someone else's code, and you don't have to invent it yourself. But when it comes to custom functions, I think it's kind of good that you also stick to naming conventions, so that you would know that this is a custom function, because most probably you also have plugins. And those plugins have a separate name, and then you have all the functions that have a FileMaker right now that's getting more and more for every release that we get. So what I do is that I use a hash before to make sure I know that these are custom functions. So FileMaker, like I said, they pull data whenever you go around in your solution for different purposes. And then they kind of store that data locally. And to understand how that's really affecting, you need to understand when and where it's doing that one. So at the AutoEnter conference that took place earlier this year, uh, uh, Kai from Soliant, he had a really, really good presentation where he explained in two different sessions on how and what is actually happening when you do different things in FileMaker. And I really urge you to look at these ones to really understand what's happening. Once you load a layout, once you create a new record, when you do a find, when you try to start scrolling in a FileMaker list, because these ones really explain what's happening. OK, we are getting into the last part, to analyze your solution. And uh, every single person that I work to, I'm kind of forcing them to follow the rules about analyzing their solution. Because whenever I do a release to my customers, this is kind of the documentation of what we've we done. It's also it's a, something that you can compare to what you've done in the past. So we have like three major ones that we can run at today. We have uh, WINS Inspector Pro, we have FM Perception from uh, Geist and Proactive. We have um, base elements from Goya in Australia. And what I'm going to show you right now is what I do in base elements. I produce a status summary of the entire solution. This is kind of my documentation of what I'm doing from the day to day with my clients. And to do that, you create the database design report, which probably all you, you have done before. And then you have two options. You have the option to create an XML, but what you can also do is you can create an HTML. The HTML is really good for when your clients are asking for documentation about your solution. It's not really, really easy to read or, or understand, but it's everything. So they can click around and try to understand what you actually have in their solution. But once you do that, you're going to get one file called summary and then a unique file for every file within your solution. You import that into base elements and it starts producing a whole bunch of things. And once it's imported, I can use a function 
that is called quick find, which is the one up the top right corner. When you do that, it will start finding things through the entire solution. So searching for the name group will find things in a whole bunch of different tables. So we'll find things in calculations, in fields, layouts, and objects. And I can just click on that one to find that specific object that I want to learn more about. So what you can do is you can get some detailed information on every single object in, within your solution. So information of what it, for a kind of object there is, in this case a button. You can get information on, on the location, on which tab or slide it's located. So sometimes when you do these tricks and you hide things on a tab, you can still get information that's it's on the tab, but you can't really see it because in the tab, you can make the tab smaller and have things hidden behind that object so it, you can't see them anymore. But what you can also see is you can see where it's used. That also gives you a reference of what things you need to address. And in the summary, there are four columns. First one being errors. That list, I always want to have as low number as possible you possible can before you have the release. And then you will get some detailed information on what kind of error there are. In this case, uh, Perform Sequence Server here is missing the script. Second one is the unreferenced items. And this will give you a really good view of things you aren't actually using with your solution. So those are the things you can start to delete because you're not using them. And then you will get some really inf good information of why it's not used. And then we have the warnings, whereas a warning could be a whole bunch of different things where they aren't really actually warning, but it's good to know. One of those things could be that you're trying to search on an unstored calculation, or it could be that you have a relationship where you have more than or smaller than. So those are good things to know. And then the last column is the performance. And as you can see here, I have quite a few things that I need to address here. So my solutions aren't really optimized in all ways for the theme. So you can get some detailed information on, on why there is performance things you can do. And then I also told you that you can compare things because there are different kind of reports you can do from the tool. So you can compare a solution that you did earlier to the current release you're going to have. And that will give you a detailed explanation of what's within this release. So you get a whole bunch of technical documentation for yourself and in the long run for your clients as well, because they're going to come ask you what was in this release. And now I passed the time already, so I'm going to run into Q&A and hopefully no way questions we can run off, but <laughs> do we have any questions? All right. I noticed that you used insert calculator result instead of set field. Why? Yes. Why? So, uh, through experience, I've learned that it's uh, the set variable is not fast. So, especially when I run through loops and I'm trying to gather a lot of data, once it reaches a certain size, it's like um, it's someone puts syrup in it. It's just becoming super slow. So then I start playing around with what other functions I had. And then I found that insert calculated result setting a variable, it's super fast compared. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, ha I have to rephrase. Uh, set field is the... Yeah, so set is field the, is, is a totally other thing. So set field is fast, but you usually don't set that up by looping a lot of things because you're setting it to a value or a text. By setting a variable, you probably... Uh, pick up a bunch of IDs, or you, you create a JSON for, for something you're going to send uh, off. And you that... insert a calculator result directly into the variable? Yes, correct. Ah, OK, then I see. Thank yes. you. Cool. Hi. It's about uh, multi-file multi authentication. Yes. How I know there's different ways of doing it, but like for FileMaker internal way, do you have any yeah, so, good way of doing it? So MFA is a big thing, and there are multiple ways of doing that one. Uh, I'd say that hooking up to the external data sources that we know and we can rely on, like Google, AWS, or Microsoft, uh, those are the ones that I kind of prefer if you want to go that way. But you can use the AD 
and then set up groups, and that will come so much easier for you, because it's kind of a big step to get into using those ADs to start off with. That, that, we, we can talk with this for an hour, but yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Any more questions? Cool. You got it all. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs>